All right. Thank you very much for joining us uh, for this session on simulation. Uh, I'm Jean-Marc, and I will be hosting the, the session. So we have uh, three very nice talks uh, that focus on simulating very different things. So that's going to be nice to see. Um, because we traded uh, quantity for quality, you'll have more time to ask the questions, but we'll make sure to finish in time still. So the first uh, paper is entitled Displacement Correlated XFEM for Simulating Brittle Factor and was co-authored by Floyd Chitalou, Tinghai Yao, Kartik Suber, and Taku Komura. And Floyd will be giving the talk. This is a talk about our paper titled Displacement Correlated XFEM for Simulating Brittle Fracture. Fracture is a natural phenomenon that can be observed in everyday life on objects like glass, statues, buildings, amongst others. In computer graphics, the animation of fracture has become a key tool to enrich special effects, such as explosions or shattering objects. In order to simulate such, effect, such effects, it is um, desirable to be able to break objects into tiny fragments. However, as can be seen in these examples, breakage alone is not quite enough because it is also crucial that we are able to preserve the geometry details on these objects. Despite all the advances made in the field, it is still challenging to simulate brittle fracture due to its intrinsic complexity. So let us now look at some methods which focus on tackling this problem. In general, getting good quality and high resolution fracture can be either time consuming or practically challenging in terms of meshing operations. As a result, Numerous simplifications and approximations are made in existing approaches. For example, purely geometric uh, methods use pre-fractured models and focus on how to produce the, des the desired output geometry. On the other hand, simulation methods approximate the underlying physics of the fracture process. In our case, we're going to go for a simulation-based uh, method because it is a more general and realistic direction to go. So let us look at the simulation-based methods in more detail. A popular choice is, of course, the finite element method, with numerous papers over the years. However, FEM is fraught with um, remeshing issues when, when, when dealing with fracture evolution problems. You could also discretize your, continu your continuum mechanics using boundary elements, or perhaps material particles, as we have begun to see more recently. However, boundary elements scale poorly and require a coupling with level sets. Obtaining rigid strata effects is also still a challenge for material particles. In this talk, I will try to convince you why, um, why the extended finite element method is also a good idea for, for fracture problems. In the meantime, I also highlight this paper here, which introduces much of the XFEM details that I'm going to glance over in this talk. Now, I'm going to argue that um, in previous methods, um, these still suffer from either scalability, stability, or realism problems for simulating the propagation of crack surfaces on arbitrary shapes. Thus, for the rest of this talk, um, it can be summarized by the following um, image. So, basically in our method, given a tetrahedra mesh, we perform simulation by, by applying given boundary conditions and computing displacements and stress as in standard XFEM. We simulate crack growth by emulating the existence of um, singular crack tip stress in the finite element domain. A key benefit is that crack initiation and propagation can be handled separately, as in linear elastic fracture mechanics. This crack propagation operates directly on an explicit mesh, which we use for enrichment and producing new fragments. To produce these new fragments, we develop also a mesh cutting algorithm, which maintains exact representation of mesh topology and sharp features on surfaces. Now, for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to describe a little bit about why we use um, extended finite elements. Then I'll briefly glance over the physics of Brita fracture. Finally, I'm going to show you how we cut surface mesh, surface mesh um, geometry. So let's dive a little bit more into extended finite elements. As we work in a volumetric domain, I'll illustrate the motivation of XFEM by making a brief contrast with traditional FEM. In this respect, I'll show you, by using this example, why XFEM is attractive for fracture evolution problems. 
For this example, um, we see that FEM requires that we conform the entire domain's discretization to the crack. The, dis the disadvantage here being that the crack cannot pass through a finite element, so we must remesh or refine. Of course, one potential solution is the boundary element method, um, but respective surface-based discretization requires a coupling with level sets, and it can be restricted on certain geometries. By contrast, XFEM retains the benefits of a full volumetric discretization without remeshing drawbacks of traditional FEM. The essential idea is based, on, is based on adding enrichment functions to the approximation space that contains a discontinuous displacement field. Thus, XFEM allows the crack to be arbitrarily aligned within the mesh due to, due to its um, enrichment capabilities. So then, to elaborate on the nu numerical problem presented by XFEM, what I'm going to do is um, take this um, object that we have here with um, a displacement boundary condition um, on the left-hand side and then also um, a crack that is um, in the middle. And then we also have some Neumann boundary conditions at the bottom vertex. And we basically want to ask ourselves, um, what is the elastostatic displacement given these boundary conditions? So for now, I'm going to ignore the fracture. So this means the degrees of freedom are just at the nodes of this two-dimensional mesh example. We then introduce the notation of u for the unknown displacements, which is what we're going to solve for. Do bear in mind at this point that in three dimensions, we are working with standard tetrahedral meshes instead of triangle meshes. So there's no introduction of new polynomial appro approximation spaces and so on. Now, my argument um, will be that the only thing that changes in, in this system are the fractures themselves. And by this, what I mean is that the structure of this part of the system matrix can remain fixed. With this, the next question then is, how do we actually include the, the fracture into um, our formulation? So let us bring the crack back in then. The unknown that we're going to solve for <coughs> is still just u, which is the node of displacements. To solve for these displacements, <coughs> to solve for these displacements, we also make a simplifying assumption that um, near the crack tip, the displacement is correlated to the crack opening displacements. This assumption will later allow us to use methods from linear elastic fracture mechanics uh, to propagate cracks while mitigating certain drawbacks of XFEM itself. Then, um, when dealing with our linear system, it will be extended strictly according to the elements completely cut by the crack. And I'm going to introduce the following notation now. As can be seen, the system matrix expands and now includes the unknown degrees of freedom for the crack. The highlighted blocks here are new according to the fracture. Then as the crack grows, we are going to intersect more elements and the highlighted blocks are going to grow accordingly. But still, the number of added degrees of freedom is significantly less um, compared to the original degrees of freedom, which is what makes XFEM efficient. So then to answer the question of why do we use enriched finite elements, first of all, the cost of matrix assembly is amortized because there's no remeshing during fracture evolution. And second, crack placement affects only the local neighborhood of the domain, which is in the vicinity of the crack. So now that we have the elastostatic solution, I will now describe about Brita fracture, and most importantly, how we handle crack propagation. Contrary to ductile fracture, a notable characteristic of Brita fracture is that it happens very quickly, up to several kilometers per second through the material. Such fractures occur commonly in very stiff materials, allowing us to assume infinitesimally small deformations or displacements. Additionally, fracture surfaces may also show features called river lines or chevron marks, and retaining these river lines and simulations adds some nice detail for visualization. And so we want a simulation that can give us these, um, these results. So then to initialize um, a crack or a crack or a fracture in our simulation, um, we use element-based fracture, where a crack is initialized inside elements. So that means in each step, we need to know if the principal stress in each element exceeds a threshold. If this threshold is exceeded, we initiate the crack mesh inside the element with the highest stress, and which is also where, where the crack itself is also aligned with the principal stress plane. For the case of crack propagation, we borrow methods from linear elastic fracture mechanics. 
From linear elastic fracture mechanics, we know that the stress tends towards infinity near the crack front. The stress field in these regions is then characterized by so-called stress intensity factors, which are useful for determining information such as um, when a crack should propagate, as well as its velocity. Several methods have been proposed uh, to determine when a crack should propagate. In graphics, Hahn and Voigt unsuccessfully demonstrated one effective approach using stress intensity factors, which we also adopt. In this scheme, the stress intensity factors are determined using the displacement correlation method. With this method, we can estimate, estimate the stress intensity factors, which we, get which we get by directly comparing the computed finite element displacements with known analytical displacement equations near the crack tip. This means that the crack propagation criterion can be expressed simply as the effective stress intensity exceeding a toughness threshold, which is a material parameter. A benefit here is that um, this greatly simplifies mesh-based crack propagation while also extending the notion of displacement correlation to the volumetric finite element domain. We refer to our paper for more details about this. So in practice then, what we have is an explicit crack mesh. This mesh is propagated over time, evaluating stress intensity factors at vertices or points near the crack front using finite element displacements. The end result is a crack surface which spans the domain from one side to another. So to recap for a moment, I have um, shown you an extended finite element formulation that includes fractures. And I've also briefly described how we compute um, or how the computed displacements can be used to estimate uh, the stress intensities. These stress intensities are in turn used to drive the crack propagation forward. Uh, now the next question is, how do we actually cut the surface mesh geometry with the simulated fracture surfaces? Or perhaps stated differently, how can we extract the new fragment mesh geometry used in the fracture surface? For this task, existing methods typically require intermediate representations like triangulations or level sets, which have a number of disadvantages. Triangulations imply the notion of piecewise linear cuts, where volume decomposition is necessary and can prove inefficient for detailed cuts. Level sets, on the other hand, offer stability advantages in terms of numerical error, but may produce undesirable visual, visual effects, sometimes requiring cutting away thin strips of material. So what we want to do in our case is directly cut surface mesh geometry and retain exact geometry de detail, except at the edges introduced by the cut itself. And I'm now going to describe on how we do this. So the input to our cutting algorithm is simply a pair of meshes, one, the, one for the source mesh to be cut and then also the cutting surface. As we aim to minimize the possibility of numerical error throughout the cutting pipeline, we adopt the half-edge data structure to represent our meshes. This data structure also offers several benefits, um, including fast connectivity lookups, and it also helps us to reason about the, the implementation. Thus, upon computing intersection points between the two meshes, we can easily retrace the connectivity along the cut path to intersect or to clip the intersecting polygons. This polygon clipping amounts to simply maintaining incidence information uh, for the polygons, edges, as well as the vertices as well. Now, since retracing of the polygons alone is insufficient to separate the mesh parts, we also carefully duplicate vertices or duplicate the, the intersection points along the cut path. Um, and um, to do so, we basically circulate around each vertex and um, to each vertex along the cut, the cut path to then create a duplicate copy for each distinct connected component seen. And the nice thing is that all of this can be done by querying the connectivity in the half-edge data structure. The end result is then uh, a mesh which is partitioned along the cut path as you can see on the right hand side here. And it follows then that applying further cuts is just simply a matter of repeating the same procedure. And the a result of that is shown on the right hand side. So let me summarize our method in this example. What we have is a cube which is dropped to the ground. Um, basically, a rigid body simulation system runs um, until a point of contact. The impulse, fo impulse forces are fed into our XFTM simulator, which initiates and propagates a crack according to the stress. The, the end result is the cube, of course. And then in this example, we also have um, um, a high uh, velocity impact between the Stanford Bunny and the Armadillo. And this is about uh, 30 minutes of uh, computation time. 
but do bear in mind that um, our implementation was not optimized in any way. In this example, we compare against the boundary element method. The boundary element method can simulate very impressive um, results, but it appears limited on thin geometries for several possible reasons, including the use of level set meshing. In contrast, our method can cater to a wider ranging set or a wider range of um, volumetric domains, requiring only that a tetrahedralization is feasible. Further, our use of explicit meshes for cracks, combined with our cutting algorithms, um, our cutting algorithm allows us to represent infinitely sharp cuts at little cost. Here we show a more direct example of our cutting algorithm in action. In this example, the armadillo is cut across the, the abdomen to split it into two. And notice also how the meshes are identical everywhere except at the edges introduced by the cut. Further examples are also shown here to demonstrate the generality of our cutting algorithm. Note that neither mesh has to be watertight, making the algorithm applicable to use cases even beyond immediate application. In this slide, we show a brief comparison to two, pro two, to two prominent related methods. As you can see, our method retains much more e a much more efficient representation, which is particularly ideal for incremental cuts as, as you tend to encounter in fracture simulations. In summary then, we propose a method for realistically simulating brittle fracture on a tetrahedral finite element discretization. The method is based on the extended finite element method, but maintains an explicit uh, representation of, of the crack surface with a high resolution mesh. Our simulation framework also includes a novel mesh cutting algorithm that operates on surface meshes with arbitrary planar polygons. This mesh cutting algorithm is used to partition meshes along the crack surface into pieces that, ca pieces that can be subsequently tetrahedralized and simulated. It is also used during fracture simulation to split the cut tetrahedra into subdomains for enrichment. And here we show um, further examples. In this case, we um, we have a statue which is which slips off and falls into the ground to smash into uh, little pieces. And in this example, we have a wrecking ball colliding with a with a statue, a concrete statue, and smashing it into numerous small fragments with um, sharp features as well. Thanks very much for your attention. All right, thank you very much for this talk. Um, so we don't have uh, any question yet from the audience. It might be my fault. So as a reminder, you can ask the questions directly during the talk. You don't have to, to wait for the end of the talk. And that way, all the people might uh, just give you a thumbs up and might help me choosing the questions. So uh, Mark McLaughlin, uh, Laughlin, Laughlin uh, is asking, did you run in 20 params with simulating very stiff materials uh, using XCFM? Um, we did not run into any particular problems relating specifically to stiff objects, but rather more uh, problems relating to um, XFEM itself and um, um, issues of meshing, uh, i.e. tetrahedralization. So those were the major issues that we faced. Um, for example, um, when uh, tetrahedralizing, tet tetrahedralizing meshes, uh, we initially used a piece of software uh, called TetGen, but um, TetGen proved rather ineffective uh, for the complex geometries that result. Uh, but luckily, we ended up using um, TetWild instead, which is a, a recent version. Yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, Alberto Martin is asking. Uh, does your model support the initialization of multiple cracks at the same time? And can all the cracks appear while others are growing? Um, at the moment, uh, we only support the, the simulation of a single crack at any given one time. Yeah. OK. Uh, Marie Balkany is asking, uh, how do you how do you account for the crack behaviorism of different materials, uh, such as butter versus glass, etc.? So 
uh, we account for for different materials by basically modifying the the, the parameters like Young's mod modulus uh, or Poisson's ratio. Um, yeah, that we that, that, as much as that, but uh, in in our simulations, we just try to find a fixed set of parameters that generally worked across uh, different examples. Sometimes um, changing them to just suit the the desired outcome that we that we desire that we wanted. Yeah, um, it is also possible um, to, for example, bias uh, crack initiation by taking advantage of the fact that within finite elements, each individual element can have um, different material properties, um, unlike the case of the, the boundary element method. Okay, uh, maybe another question. So uh, uh, I would like to know, uh, could you tell us a bit uh, about the most challenging examples? Uh, are they related to the geometry of the input model? Just for example, is it more difficult to simulate uh, the fractures on a honeycomb model than on a sphere model? Um, so the, the difficulties, I think, would be related to the overall um, the, the overall shape of the domain. Um, so um, the more concavities that you yeah, that you have. Um, yeah, the, the the more likely it could be that um, you uh, get like ill-shaped elements, and uh, with ill-shaped elements, you may uh, get uh, like issues like bad condition numbers for your stiffness matrix, etc. Um, an example being the 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 simulation that you saw at the end with the statue and the wrecking ball. Um, yeah, we actually had to uh, run that. Um, yeah, definitely a few times before we could get things just to work uh, perfectly. Um, this is a, a, a known problem of um, XFEM, and this is not something that we tackled. And certainly I would, I would um, recommend that in the future, people do try to uh, solve this problem, even ourselves as well, Yeah, as potential future work. Yeah. OK. Uh, do you think that, for example, uh, using higher order finite elements would uh, could be a lead for that? Potentially, uh, yes. Uh, however, there are other technical problems. For example, um, the condition number can be sensitive to the volume ratio uh, between the two subdomains. Like if I cut a finite element in two pieces, if one of the sub volumes is too small relative to the other one, then that leads to yeah, bad condition numbers, etc. So it's a little bit more complex rather than just increasing the, the, the order of the, the shape function, say. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank I enjoyed you. Uh, also very much your other papers. So congratulations on the uh, on the Thanks. very fruitful year. Ah, maybe last question then. Uh, what does prevent the current model to handle multiple cracks at once or single crack branching? Um, I didn't get the first part, but I understood the branching aspect. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll address the branching part. So the, the issue with branching is that uh, we are using an explicit mesh. And uh, with an explicit mesh, it's, um, I, I did not explicitly say this, but it's, uh, it's a manifold uh, surface. And the moment at which you begin to handle branching, it's almost like you have to go into the domain of handling uh, non-manifold non meshes. And it's unclear to me at the moment how to uh, start dealing with that. So, um, Perhaps other routes, like um, the, the use of um, level sets, like what we saw in the boundary element method, could uh, help a little bit where you kind of combined um, explicit meshes with, with level sets so as to manage uh, joining cracks together. Yeah. OK, well. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next paper, uh, which is called Interactive Mesoscale Simulation of Skyscrapes. And was co-authored by Ulysse Vimon, James Gain, Maud Lastic, Guillaume Cordonnier, Babatunde Abdurdoun, and Marie-Paul Cani. And Ulysse Vimon will give the talk. Hello, everyone. My name is Ulysse Vimon, and today I will present to you the paper called Interactive Mesoscale Simulation of Skyscapes. But first, I would like you to have a look at those skyscape pictures and think about what they convey. As
As you can see, skyscapes convey various information such as the time of the day or the season. It is also the main light source of outdoor scenes and plays an important role there. For instance, on a sunny day, the lighting is very direct, creating sharp shadows and strong color contrasts. On the other hand, an overcast day sheds a more diffuse and dimmer light. As such, it participates in the mood of a virtual scene. Beyond that, if you use your virtual world for simulating activities such as piloting, skiing or farming, which are very weather dependent, weather plays a central role there. As we see here, skyscapes, and most importantly weather, deserves our attention in virtual worlds. Let us now see how they have been modeled in previous work. For that, I need you to picture an axis pointing one way toward efficiency and the other way toward consistency. On the, on the consistency side of the spectrum, you have full-fledged atmospheric models such as WRF. They use physically based simulation which require an enormous computational power and yield very realistic results, so much that they get used for weather forecasts. Their consistency comes at a computational price that makes them unusable in computer graphics. Instead, most methods in our field focus on the efficiency side of the spectrum. Procedural methods use cube maps, sprites, overlays and more recently volumetric rendering of noise functions for modeling various phenomena. Those methods are usually used independently from one another through predefined scenarios and rule sets. The, the resulting weather model has a reasonable computational cost, but this comes at the price of consistency. For instance, nothing forbids cumulus to show up when the sky is overcast by zero stratus, which does not happen in reality. Our goal here is to sample the middle of this spectrum helping to create a consistent and yet efficient weather model for virtual worlds. Here is the plan for the rest of the presentation. First, I will present to you how we addressed this weather modeling challenge by feeding the output of an augmented 2.5D fluid simulation to a custom procedural model. Then, I will show how efficient and consistent the resulting weather model is and how it can be improved. So, let's get started. First, let us define our model structure. Our virtual world is a terrain of 50 by 50 kilometers, the typical size of a virtual world, like the map of a video game, for instance. Our goal is to model the atmosphere above this terrain that we model as a box that sits directly on top of the ground. Its horizontal scale is that of the terrain, which is big enough to capture local weather patterns such as uh, valley system winds. And this is, by the way, what categorizes our model as mesoscale, as opposed to synoptic scale, which would be large enough to capture planetary patterns. Vertically, our box is 10 km thick, with the ground at it, as its lower boundary and the tropopause as its upper boundary. The tropopause is the real-world location where the temperature stops decreasing with altitude, which has the effect of capping all convection beneath it and hence all weather. We populate this domain with horizontal fixed layer, each containing a 2D Eulerian simulation of a fluid. So let us now review how those simulations work. Each layer contains a velocity field discretized in a 512 times 512 grids, which makes for about 100 meter cells. And these fields might be divergent. So to counter that, the standard solution is to compute a dynamic pressure field. This is done by solving the Poisson equation, meaning that we compute iteratively a scalar field such that, such that its Laplacian equals the divergence of the velocity. We then subtract the gradients of the pressure field to the velocity field, and this step is called projection. It has the effect of making its divergence free. The last step is to transport all cell content to other cells based on the velocity times the time step. This process, called advection, is applied to velocity itself, making it non-divergence free, and so the process can repeat itself on and on. When put together, it looks something like that. Here we have concentration, you can visualize the velocity as well as the pressure that has been computed from the velocity divergence. Right. 
Now, to transform our fluid model into an atmospheric model, we need to add a couple of things. First, in the video I just showed you, the only field that was advected alongside velocity was an unspecified concentration field, which value was used to color pixels. Instead, our model embeds meaningful values, namely temperature, moisture, and liquid water, allowing us to represent the central part of weather, the water cycle. Those fields are combined with static pressure to compute evaporation and condensation, along with the latent heat absorption and release following st standard thermodynamics. So, as of now, our, at our atmospheric model consists in horizontal layers, each embedding an independent thermodynamic fluid simulation. Such a representation gets done on computation, while preserving the notion of different atmospheric stages. However, it prevents any vertical motion, which completely defeats the purpose of modeling weather. To fix that, we reintroduce vertical motion in two distinct forms. The first, that we call convective uplift, is computed based on a difference of moist static energy. This energy combines the temperature, the height, and the moisture of a parcel of air into a term that is preserved through adiabatic evolution. When a parcel of air is located below another one with a lesser moist static energy, it undergoes a vertical force resulting in a motion called convection. Therefore, to compute convection, we compute the difference in moist static energy between all pairs of vertically adjacent cells. In the same spirit, we compute dynamic uplift proportional to the dynamic pressure difference between vertically adjacent cells. Finally, we assemble those two forces into a vertical transport term that we use to move cell contents vertically. At this point, it is important to note that we do not have a permanent encoding of dynamic pressure. Instead, during simulation, we compute it from the velocity field at each time step. This means that the volume of air transported vertically will not automatically induce a lower pressure at the initial position, nor a higher pressure at the final one. That is something we need to account for manually by adding a pressure term based on the intensity of the vertical transport before the velocity projection of our fluid simulation scheme. Now, our atmospheric model is almost complete. All we need to add is the terrain-atmosphere interaction. A terrain is often represented with a height map for altitude. To that, we add various fields representing temperature, water content, and albedo. We model the direction of the sun based on a simplified celestial model, and from there we use a simple gray body model for updating the terrain temperature using ray marching, which accounts for cloud shadows and self-shadowing. We consider two ways in which the terrain influences the atmosphere itself. But first, let us notice that some layers might intersect the ground. In that case, the terrain acts locally on the layer immediately above it. So, the first interaction is heat and moisture exchange, corresponding to conduction and evaporation respectively, and once again we follow thermodynamics here. The second interaction is a bit more complex. The terrain can be an obstacle to airflow. In 2D Eulerian fluid simulation, obstacles are usually accounted for by setting the velocity to zero inside them, as you can see here on the top left picture. This induces a sharp divergence of the velocity field around the obstacle boundary. That in turn creates a high pressure area windward of the obstacle, as well as a low pressure area in the lee. This forces the velocity to go around the obstacle through the process of projection that we described earlier. In our case, dynamic uplift allows the air to pass on top of an obstacle. However, this vertical motion should ideally happen even without the terrain intersecting the lowest layer of air. So we decided to introduce a smooth damping factor called orographic velocity damping. Its value is zero where the layer is below the terrain and varies smoothly up to one where the terrain is sufficiently far below it. Okay, our weather model is now complete. All there is left is to find a way to visualize the output of the simulation. 
First, we can notice that amongst all of the fields that we represent in the model, only liquid water is visible. So, to visualize that, we could export a 3D texture of interpolated liquid water data and uh, use it as a dispersive material in a ray tracer. But the problem with that is that it would look very bland because our cell size, which is of about 100 meters, do not allow us to resolve precise cloud feature. So everything would look pretty, pretty blobby. One central idea here is to use another output of our model, namely convection, to drive a procedural noise-based cloud model. A high convection tells us that our cloud should look cumuliform meaning that it should have a typical puffy and lumpy appearance. On the other hand, a low convection means that our cloud should look more stratiform, typically smooth. In order to distinctively represent the whole cloud spectrum, we augmented the standard taxonomy, usually focused on altitude, to include convectivity on the horizontal axis. By computing the position of each cell of each layer in this diagram, we are able to associate it with one of those 10 types. Then, at each time step, and for each cloud type, we extrude vertically the corresponding area and we export the resulting shape. To generate the result you are about to see, those shapes were imported into the TerraGen 4 renderer and associated with a volumetric material which visual parameters such as noisiness have been tuned for matching their real-world counterparts. So now let me show how this all looks. This first case shows an island on a hot day. Islands make for good temperature contrast and the air surrounding them is very moist, which produces large cumulus in the real world. If our model works as expected, we should see large cumulus appearing here too. And that's a success. So this displays the capacity of our model to capture convective motion. Each cloud that you see here results from a chain of simulated events. The sun heats the ground, that heats the lower, the lower layer of air, that rises through convection, bringing moist into the upper layers where the lower pressure and temperature causes condensation. This results in a cell containing liquid water and getting categorized as cumulus due to their high convectivity value and those cells are then rendered using this uh, puffy and lumpy volumetric material. The features that you observe on the clouds result purely from the volumetric noise associated with the material. They are of a smaller size than that of the simulation cell which would make them impossible to see without the convectivity based categorization. The second case shows a mountainous area with strong prevailing winds. In the real world, such configuration tends to produce elongated lenticular clouds. And the good news is that our model does that too, which displays its capacity to model uh, the non-convective vertical motion. Each cloud that you see here results from a slightly different chain of events. Prevailing wind creates divergence of the velocity in the windward area of the mountain due to orographic velocity damping, and this induces a high pressure area that triggers dynamic vertical transport, again causing water condensation. But this time, the cells containing liquid water are categorized as stratus due to their low convectivity and altitude, and are hence rendered using a smooth volumetric material. This final example showcases various cloud types representable with our method. Here we can see Cumulus, Altostratus, Cirrus, and Cirrostratus. Note that higher level clouds are not fully dependent on local weather pattern. We had to feed external cloud data through the boundary to get those. But the in interesting thing to observe is that those high altitude clouds cast a shadow on the ground, which decreases solar heat influx. In turn, the ground cools, which stops convection, and make cumulus disappear, as you will observe in the real world. You might have noticed that our results do not visually match reality perfectly. 
this comes from the mesoscale of our model. First, we do not simulate Markov scales, meaning everything under 100 meters, which makes it impossible to see what I show on the video right now. This is because noise is not advected, so no cloud features are preserved through motion. On a larger scale, clouds get advected but not deformed vertically, because the representation is essentially 2.5D. So, high altitude stratiform clouds such as Cyrus are very wind dependent and those are pretty badly depicted by our model. Second, we do not model synoptic scale, meaning everything above 50 km. It might not fit some situations, like a jetliner simulation, which would require a much larger area to be covered. But most importantly, some weather phenomena, such as the storm shown here, simply take more space than that to emerge so those will never be correctly represented by our model. Third, and this one is not related to scale, we combine simulation and procedural modeling in a simple framework, but both approaches tend to require many parameter tuning, and our method inherited that. So you have to set layer counts and altitudes, interaction coefficients, classification, classification thresholds, and visual parameters to name a few. Both kind of approaches are also known to have complex interfaces, and I let you judge the complexity of ours as shown here. The user can paint directly on the grid through this interface, adding temperature, moisture, and velocity when needed, but uh, this kind of breaks the consistency of the weather. So, we do combine simulation and procedural modeling in a single framework. But does it enable us to model weather in a consistent and yet efficient manner? Regarding the efficiency, as, as said earlier, we use a 50 by 50 kilometer map with 100 meter cells. All examples use tr three layers, so that amounts to about 800,000 cells. The same 3D simulation with the same resolution would have 26 million cells, so we saved 97% of the cell counts. It's safe to say that vertical down sampling helped a lot to improve performances. However, a frame still takes up to 4 seconds to compute, which is a lot for the kind of application that we target. This comes in part from the complexity of the phenomena that we are modeling, and in another part from our codes, which do not make extensive use of GPU as it could. But then all is not lost. Weather usually evolves pretty slowly, and this allows us to use large time steps of 30 seconds. Spreading the computational costs across the 30 seconds yields a frame rate of 7.5 FPS, which is not yet real time, but good enough for some interactive applications. Of course, the rendering takes way too much for that, but that is out of the scope of this research project. Real time volumetric rendering techniques do exist, and uh, as, discuss as discussed at the beginning of the presentation, and would be a perfect match for our model. In conclusion, we presented one of the first weather models for virtual worlds. This model is based on a simplified layered structure of the atmosphere and its evolution, allowing for real world patterns to emerge. So the consistency box is ticked set aside the limitations I just mentioned. Regarding efficiency, we do achieve interactive computational time thanks to a large time step allowing us to spread the charge, but we do not reach real-time frequencies, so that box is only halfway ticked. Let's conclude with some perspectives. First, the same model described here can be better taken advantage of by using other output data fields. For example, wind could be used for animating virtual world objects, such as trees and flags. Temperature and moisture could also be used to modify ground appearance, for instance, through modeling frost. But then the model could be extended to represent more phenomena. One that instantly pops in mind is precipitation. Rain, drizzle, snow and hail would require little extra work to be added, and that would give rise to a much more complete virtual weather for virtual worlds. Thank you for your attention.
All right. Congratulations on a very nice work. Um, Thank you. So we have already plenty of questions. So Christophe Lino is asking uh, whether there are numerous, well, there are numerous parameters, but uh, uh, so if you, if you want a rainy day, could uh, we have six presets of all parameters, and no matter the, the geometry of the scene? Well, <coughs> rain can come from different uh, phenomena. We have rain that comes from cumulonimbus uh, that are very uh, convective clouds, and those require a terrain which stores a lot of energy, a lot of heat, and then releases it. So in that case, it's it's pretty dependent on the terrain. And if you want a drizzle instead, which comes from a, like a warm front passing on top of your terrain, this is independent of the terrain. So in that case, you could have a kind of a boundary condition presets that allows you to, to show that. Okay. Um. Sam Ishrek is asking, did you consider machine learning to add details to the blobby crowds uh, as it has been done with smoke simulations, for example? We did not consider that, but it would clearly be a good match because as of now, it's as if we had done the machine learning ourselves by tuning the parameters of the visual presentation for the clouds. It was kind of a, a long work and it's not a perfect result. So clearly, machine learning could be could be used to improve the visual appearance based on the same output data from the procedural model. We could have machine learning uh, infer parameters for visualization that would be better than the one we have now. Okay. Uh, actually, a related question that uh, uh, comes to mind is uh, whether you, your procedural method could be well, used to generate data for machine learning. Mm, yeah, if you want to, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you repeat? Well, uh, because now we have a procedural model that uh, allows you to simulate possibly hundreds, thousands of uh, of these uh, simulations. Mm -hmm. uh, could it be possible to use this generated data by generated by your algorithm to train a, a neural network, for example? Uh, well, yes, uh, as any content generation method, it can be used to, to feed the input, uh, to, to, to feed, to create the data to feed uh, your neural network. I'm not sure what you would learn from those data, what would be the output, though. Okay, um, I have a, a final question. So uh, the, um, the layer uh, coupling seems uh, uh, to be a bit ad hoc, but I don't know that much actually, but uh, this type of works, but it seems very, very efficient. And uh, you mentioned that uh, your algorithm does not require as much memory as uh, voxel grids, for example. Uh, if you had a, a supercomputer and as much memory as you want, would you keep kind of, would you, would you add layers or do you think that at some point too many layers would uh, defeat the purpose of using your method. It would clearly defeat the purpose because uh, even if you had infinitely many layers, it would never converge to a full QE simulation because of the assumptions that we made. So if you have infinite computational power, the better, the best approach is to use uh, meteorologic models that use a full 3D simulation. We try to, to mimic that without the computational cost. All right, and maybe another question uh, would be, uh, would you consider uh, following the same types of uh, of method to simulate uh, other gigantic environments, such as, for example, or oceanic uh, currents or stuff like this? Yeah, it's a, it's a good idea. The, the Really, the nice thing with the layers in the atmosphere is that we want to visually distinguish layers for identifying clouds. I'm not sure that you have that equivalent with the oceanic currents, but apart from that, it might be that you have a surface current and a lower level currents, and that it might be a good idea to model those independently with a, with a layered simulation. Oh, 
Thank you very much. Congratulations again. Um, so maybe we can move on to the final talk, uh, which is called Simulation of Dentritic Painting. Uh, that's a work that was co-authored by Jose Canabal, Miguel Otadui, Byung Moon Kim, and Jose Echevarria. And uh, Jose Canabal will give the talk. Hello, everybody. My name is Jose. And I'm going to present our paper, Simulation of Dendritic Painting. Dendritic painting is an oil painting technique with mesmerizing visual effects. The painting surface is covered first with a base medium, typically white acrylic paint diluted with water. During the creative process, the artist pours on the base medium a mix of acrylic ink and a solvent, typically alcohol or some acid. The complex multiphase fluid dynamics between solvent, ink, and a base medium produce rich and expressive high frequency branching effects on the ink as it flows and deposits. This allows the artist to create complex pieces of art from pottery to frames. In theory, it looks simple just a few drops of ink mixed with the solvent, and we obtain rich and colorful patterns. But there are some drawbacks that we have to take into account. First, dendritic painting is hard to master due to the fact that finding the desired proportions of ink, solvent, and base medium is quite challenging. And second, it is almost impossible to obtain the desired shapes or to have some control over the pattern growth. To avoid these drawbacks, we propose a digital painting simulation of dendritic painting with artist control. However, to simulate in, in a physics based way would require a very high resolution multiphase fluid simulation with complex boundary conditions, not suitable for interactive digital painting. We propose transforming the multiphase fluid problem into a phenomenological one that models branching phenomena explicitly using pattern growth algorithm and couples pattern growth to the fluid dynamics of solvent and ink. Next, let me highlight the main contributions of our paper. We introduce a new reaction diffusion model for dendritic patterns for digital painting. Thanks to our carefully designed reaction and diffusion terms, we can obtain more organic and controllable shapes compared with previous methods in computer graphics that focus more on regular pattern and crystal growth. We also design a two-way coupling between the pattern growth simulation and the solvent and ink dynamics, which mimics the complex boundary conditions in the underlying multiphase phenomenon. This allows us to control how much the pattern grows based on the amount of solvent and how the ink flows over it. Overall, we provide the first simulation pipeline for dendritic painting. We complement the pattern growth and fluid dynamic simulations with pigment advection and various control and editing operations that allow the artist to play with the digital tool to create all kinds of art pieces in a straightforward way. There are two main fields that are related with our work, digital painting and dendritic pattern growth. Digital painting is a well-known area in computer graphics, as it has been a lot of interest from the industry to be able to paint in a digital media. Some works close to our dendritic painting simulation are watercolor simulations like Moxie from Chu et al., where they simulate the interaction of water ink and paper in a multi-layer simulation pipeline. Other recent works handle oil painting like wet brush from Chen et al. that shows that there are still interest in this field and that it can be improved. Dendritic patterns appear in a lot of different fields as is a pattern very common in nature. We have dendritic growth when we talk about viscous fingers, when we talk about fungal or bacterial growth, and when we talk about crystal growth. Due to this and its beauty, it has also been studied over the years in the field of computer graphics. From the works of Kim et al. about its formation, or the most recent work of Ren et al. that uses phase field models with orientation fields, 
to the viscous finger simulations like the work of Seagal et al. Now, I will present an overview of our digital dendritic painting system that is formed by three layers that combine multiple simulation methodologies and they interact with each other. We have the solvent layer. This layer models the behavior of the solvent by using a 2D fluid simulation that is based on the lattice Boltzmann method. The expansion of the liquid is constrained to the pattern layer. This layer simulates the pattern growth with reaction diffusion equations that models the evolution of the catalyst material and the active and curved pattern depths. The catalyst density is coupled with the solvent layer through boundary conditions, while the solvent layer affects the growth of the pattern through the reaction diffusion equations of the active depth. Finally, the third layer simulates the fluid dynamics and pigment mixing of the ink using again a 2D fluid simulation based on the lattice Boltzmann method. As we can see, the ink layer is coupled with the pattern layer through boundary conditions and with the solvent layer through viscous forces between those two layers. Let's start with the pattern growth layer. As I mentioned in the overview section, we simulate the dendritic pattern growth using a reaction diffusion model. This model is a well-known PDE that tracks the evolution of some scalar field over time as a result of a diffusion and a reaction. We have succeeded to model the complex branching effects thanks to the evolution of three different scalar fields, which are tracked using three different reaction diffusion equations. These scalar fields are the active depth, the catalyst, and the carb depth densities. Now, let's analyze each of these equations in more detail. First, we start with the active depth density field. Here is where most of the complexity of our pattern growth lies. The active pattern defines the growth of the pattern on its boundary and its evolution depends on the catalyst and the solvent. We can see how the solvent density affects both the diffusion and the reaction terms. Analyzing in more detail each term, we have a heavy side function that depends on the solvent density and it's used for boundary effects, avoiding the diffusion of the pattern if the solvent density is below some threshold delta that in our examples is 0 0.1. The second term is just a nonlinear diffusion with some diffusion coefficients that we will comment later. The first term of the reaction increases the pattern depth as a result of mixing catalyst and solvent, while the second term transforms active pattern into curved pattern how strong are these terms depends on the value of the beta's parameters. The second scalar field that we are going to analyze is the catalyst. Here we have a standard linear diffusion term modulated by its corresponding diffusion coefficient alpha and a reaction term function that is bilinear with respect to the catalyst density and the active pattern depth. Finally, we have the curve depth, that is the simplest one, as the curve pattern evolves only due to the transformation of a tip depth, so no diffusion is required here. Now we are going to analyze the different parameters and how they affect the shape of our patterns. Here we analyze the effects of nonlinear diffusion by changing the value of k. We can see how linear diffusion with k equals 1 is not able to reproduce branches, while higher values are able to reproduce the branches that we want in our patterns. We have chosen a value of 2 for all of our examples. One important aspect that I want to mention is that we have chosen a regular discretization for our domain, as it is easy and friendly for GPUs to compute finite differences on it. We found that the most common five-pointed Laplacian stencil was not able to simulate correctly 
radial dendritic patterns due to anisotropies of the regular grip. That's why we have chosen a 9-point Laplacian stencil that minimizes the artifacts due to the regular structure of the grid. Please see the paper for more details. Other important term is the noise function that allows us to mitigate even more the anisotropy of the grid discretization even with low values. This way we can achieve more organic shapes in the branches. Finally, we are going to analyze the diffusion and reaction coefficients that control how strong are the diffusion and reaction terms and how they affect the overall shape of the pattern. Starting with the diffusion coefficients, we can see how increasing the active pattern alpha affects strongly the thickness and sharpness of the pattern branches, with smaller values leading to thinner and sharper branches, while increasing the catalyst alpha reduces the gap between branches. On the other hand, the reaction coefficients parameters affects mainly the speed of growth and the gap between branches. This ability to change the shape of the patterns by modifying different parameters allows us to increase the expressiveness of our paintings, as we can see in this example. Here we can see thin and organic branches, like the ones at the left of the painting, but also we can see other type of patterns with thicker branches, like the ones at the right of the image. This combination of different patterns make the final painting visually more rich and complex. Now, let's focus on the solvent layer. This layer is what truly curves the pattern, but we also need to model its fluid dynamic behavior. This layer is a 2D fluid simulation based on the Lattice Boltzmann model. We have chosen this approach due to the fact that has been used with success in other painting applications and due to its simplicity. We have chosen the D2Q9 discretization, where there are 9 lattice vectors E, and 9 distribution functions F per cell. The density and velocity of the fluid are computed using these terms. In general, one great thing about Lattice Boltzmann is that everything is computed using local operations, making it suitable for GPU computation. There are two main steps in the Lattice Boltzmann solver. First, the streaming step where we stream the distribution functions along the e-vectors, computing tentative distribution functions due to advection. And the second step that relaxes the distribution function towards equilibrium by using the equilibrium distribution function. In our implementation, this function takes the typical form needed to make the fluid incompressible. As I already commented in the overview section, the solvent and the pattern are coupled through boundary conditions. To do so, we modify the streaming step by adding a partial blocking that depends on the catalyst density. We compute the average blocking factor between the neighbor cells during the streaming step. This blocking factor is one outside the catalyst region, stopping the solvent at the boundary efficiently, while it can flow freely in regions with less amount of catalyst. As we are using a single phase Lattice Boltzmann model, we could have negative densities at the boundary, as the original model expects a small variation in the density field. Borrowed from the work of Moxie, we have a smooth step function in the equilibrium distribution function that mitigates this problem. Finally, we are going to analyze the third layer, responsible of the ink simulation. In the same way as the solvent layer, this layer performs a 2D fluid simulation based on the Lattice Boltzmann model. In this case, we set our blocking factor for boundary conditions to a function that depends on the pattern density allowing the ink to flow only in this region. We also couple this layer with the solvent layer by adding viscous forces between them. These viscous forces are stronger in the inner regions of the pattern, 
when negligible, close to the boundary. We update the solvent velocity and the ink velocity using the same force with opposite sign, making their velocity similar in these inner regions. In this layer, we also handle the pigment mixing. We represent our pigment as a 3D vector field corresponding to the C and Y color space. More complex color models, as Kubel Kamonk, can be used but a simple CMY interpolation was enough to produce colorful patterns in our case. The pigment field is advected using a semi-Lagrangian advection scheme. More accurate advection schemes can be used if needed, but it was fast and good enough for our needs. In the real phenomena, ink gets dry over time, stopping flowing along the pattern. We mimic this effect by adding a new 3D vector field, PD, which represents the pigment that is dry. Then, wet pigment dries over time with a linear relationship that depends on the drying coefficient beta t. This simple model is enough to get results close to the physical phenomena. Finally, we are going to show some results while we present some features added to improve the controllability of this painting technique. The first feature that we have is the possibility to use a guidance field that forces the pattern to grow in a specific direction. We achieve this by adding a new reaction term to the reaction diffusion equations of the active depth, where B is the custom guidance field. The basic idea is to make the reaction stronger when the normal of the front of the pattern is aligned with the guidance field. We can modulate how strong the pattern adapts to the guidance fields by using the beta parameter. We also allow the user to add a new base medium to the simulation. This action erases the previous pattern in that region, making the pattern to grow again with new branches that propagate from the boundary to the inside, creating nice expansion and color variation effects. Another feature that we have that is only possible with our digital tool is to handle boundary shapes. We can set a 2D mask to define boundary condition and make the pattern stop growing outside those regions. We achieve this by adding Noman boundary conditions for the active depth and catalyst reaction diffusion equations. This allows us to create complex shapes like this butterfly. Finally, we want to show that we can combine all these features with some traditional painting or a photo to create fun drawings and animations easily. Imagine how much time you will need to animate or simply draw the hair with this particular look with a traditional painting tool. As conclusions, we have presented the first dendritic painting simulation pipeline, a phenomenological model carefully designed to mimic the complex multiphase fluid phenomena of this particular painting technique, making it easy to use for everybody. However, further research is needed in some areas. In the real phenomena, we can observe some violent reaction with mixing the ink with the solvent that we are not able to reproduce. Also, it could be interesting to explore more accurate simulation models for the liquid simulation with free surface. We have used lattice Boltzmann model, but the important point is not the fluid simulation method. Other methods might work just fine. The important point in our work is how we incorporate the boundary conditions into the fluid method. We also believe that we should be able to improve the flow in thin branches, exploring recent advection schemes. This work also can inspire others. For example, there are other painting techniques like acrylic pour painting that is popular in social media due to their beauty that probably can be simulated with a similar approach. Also, other dendritic growth phenomena coupled with fluid dynamics could be inspired by this work. Thank you.
Okay. Very nice work. Congratulations. So we don't have questions yet. So let me start um, by um, asking about. Um, uh, you, you don't show examples on uh, curved meshes, on curved surfaces, no. right? Mm -hmm. uh, in your opinion, what would be the, the main uh, challenge to take your technique and adapt it to uh, triangle meshes? Mm -hmm. It depends on the thing that you want to do. Uh, if you just want to project your simulation onto a curved surface, uh, there are two possibilities. The first one is just to parameterize or to, uh, our simulation or to simulate in a flat surface and then mapping into, into a curved surface. Another possibility will be instead of using a regular grid, uh, this reaction diffusion simulations also can work with uh, uh, triangle meshes. Uh, the problem will be how to handle the fluid simulations in those cases. Uh, but we could adapt, for example, uh, fluid simulation based on on meshes. But we 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 have, we we should uh, figure out how to handle boundary conditions uh, correctly. Uh, but it will be an interesting research line because this technique is also used a lot of in pottery, and in those cases you have the gravity force acting. On the shape of the patterns, so it would be nice to have those effects uh, in the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you said that uh, it, it was dependent on the choice of Laplacian operator that uh, you you tried. Uh, have you tried for even on two D? Have you tried uh, mapping your um, creating a exaggerated um, yeah, triangle grid? With um, perfectly shaped elements. Yeah, we didn't try with triangle meshes, but uh, for example, if your triangle mesh is an irregular triangle mesh from a uh, Delanois triangulation, uh, you you can have uh, naturally these uh, organic shapes without needing the noise function, for example, because this noise function is needed for the, to avoid this grid alignment with the regular structure of the grid uh, that we also compensate in part using this uh, nine-point Laplacian stencil instead of the five-point Laplacian stencil. But with triangle meshes, if they are not regular, this, this noise, this uh, the, uh, these organic shapes uh, appear natural. Okay. Um, related to the noise function, so mm -hmm. I like very much that actually you, you need that. Uh, do you think that it's related to some realistic uh, physical parameters, such as, for example, uh, the rugosity of your uh, of your surface? Yeah, it, it would be interesting to explore that. Uh, but it's super hard to get the uh, parameters from the real life. <laughs> uh, it's just a try and error, uh, combining different mixing of alcohol with ink and the base medium. And just to have uh, nice results, you can spend hours until you get the first nice shapes. So I think it, it will be hard to to translate directly from the real world parameters in terms of concentration of values uh, to the to our tool. Maybe it's more interesting uh, an artist's approach. Like with these parameters, you can have these kind of shapes, and you can play in a shape space or something like that instead of trying to replicate uh, different parameters that are hard to control in real life. So, so for example, you could guide your approach using uh, a BRDF uh, yeah. picture, for example. Um, Ulysse Vimon is asking, uh, have you tried interacting directly with, with the velocity field of the fluid simulation to deform the density patterns? Yeah. Uh, 
we try to just apply an affection scheme over the whole simulation and you can deform the, the shape of the pattern. Uh, this is interesting because in real life you can move the canvas and moving the canvas will create a vector field that boosts everything. It's not like the guidance field that that we have that is just to to make uh, controllable shapes uh, but you, you can apply uh, some distortion over the velocity field and affect all these uh, all these reaction diffusion equations and and the fluid simulations to have these effects like you are moving the canvas uh, and all the information is deforming. Yeah. Okay, um, so I have another question maybe. Um, so the shapes that you obtain, so they are mm -hmm. very beautiful and they look like the fractals. And you yeah. show stuff like, looks like uh, snowflakes, for example. Um, have you have you given uh, any thoughts uh, to uh, the creation of infinite textures, like uh, fractals, that could uh, refine on demand if you were to zoom in continuously inside a pixel, for example? Like it exists a bit for uh, the so called infinite textures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it will be really interesting uh, because also our simulations are more rich and more beautiful when high frequency details appear. Um, right now, as we handle the simulation, that is uh, just a regular grid, and we are not optimizing, but maybe a multi-scale approach will be super interesting to try to do these things, because also uh, not at every time uh, everything is simulated, uh, there is a, some things happening on the grid. Uh, most of the time it's just at the boundaries of the shape where the patterns are growing. So it could be interesting to explore these multi-scale approaches to add uh, more detail in these fractal, fract, uh, fractal structures uh, without too much penalty cost of the, due to the computation. Yeah, it would be really interesting. Okay. Uh, maybe finally, uh, so the images that you produce are already uh, very, very nice. Um, when, when you have when you have solvent or ink on the surface, it changes slightly the, the height and the normal. Uh, have you tried uh, taking this into account to design maybe for rendering? Reach up, yes, yes, yeah, for rendering. Yeah, we, we explored that at the beginning of the project. Uh, but the results uh, weren't mm, as close to the real painting because in the real painting that everything happens in a real, real thin layer, so it doesn't affect too much. And and we just went for the simple color scheme and and a manipulation of the color without complex VR depths or rendering techniques that will increase the cost of the of, of, of the rendering and the cost of the performance of our application. So yeah. We consider it. Okay. Well um, thank you very much. So Uris Vimon is saying it will also be nice to perform the simulation on a spherical yeah. domain. It's not really a question but much mm -hmm. for future work. Yeah, in 3D surface in general, it would be yeah. nice. And taking into account these external forces, it would be nice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to all of us. So maybe everybody can, I don't know, thank everybody virtually. Um, so we have uh, 10 minutes break before you can uh, move on to the next of the conference. Uh, thank you very much and have a good day.